Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the LGBTQI webinar presented by CJCA. My name is Mike Dempsey, and I'm the executive director for CJCA. And today's webinar focuses on LGBTQI youth in the juvenile justice settings, closing the gap between recommended practice and reality. I want to thank you all for taking the time to participate in today's webinar. For those of you who might be new to CJCA, we are a national nonprofit organization formed in 1994 to improve juvenile justice systems, local secure correctional and residential facilities, services, programs, and most importantly, the long-term outcomes for youth and their families. CJCA represents the youth and juvenile justice system CEOs in all 50 states, Puerto Rico, and various major metropolitan count counties across the country. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Jonah for a couple of very quick housekeeping items, and then I'll come back and introduce our presenter for today. Thank you, Mike. So a couple of quick uh, housekeeping items right now before we get started. Uh, if your audio is through your phone, you can enter your PIN number uh, on your phone number, and that will be in the GoToWebinar control panel. Everyone will be muted. All attendees will be muted for the duration of this call. Uh, but there will be a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. If you have a question, you can type them into the GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll get to all your questions at the end. The webinar is being recorded, so a link to the recording of the webinar and the PowerPoint presentation will be sent out following the close of the webinar. Thank you. And I'll turn it back to Mike. Thank you, Jonah. So I want to uh, start off by giving a special thanks to our presenter for today, Curry Cook, who is the director of the Youth in Out of Home Care Project and counsel with Lambda Legal, the oldest and largest national legal organization committed to achieving full recognition of the civil rights of lesbian, gay men, bisexuals, transgender people, and everyone living with HIV. Curry advocates across the country for LGBTQ youth and youth living with HIV and child welfare and juvenile justice settings, and youth experiencing homelessness via impact of litigation, policy advocacy, and education. Before joining Lambda Legal in 2013, Curry was the co-director of the Bronx Office of the Children's Law Center in New York, a nonprofit law firm representing children in custody, visitation, guardianship, domestic violence, paternity, and related child abuse and neglect proceedings in New York City Family Court. Prior to his work at CLCNY, Curry served as a consultant to the National Juvenile Defender Center in Washington, D.C., and worked in Burundi on an American Bar Association's rule of law initiative to assist with reintegrate former child soldiers into the community. In 2009, he served as a visiting professor for the Child Advocacy Clinic in Rutgers Law School, Newark. Curry is a highly experienced and recognized expert in LGBTQI issues within the juvenile justice setting. And we are all looking forward to hearing from him today to help guide us in further developing policy and procedures that close the gap between practice and reality. So Curry, thank you very much for taking the time to put your presentation together and taking the time to present to our, uh, to our group today. Thank you, Mike, and thanks so much for everyone who's joined. I, I really am thrilled to see such a big turnout and especially from just places all across the country. Um, and I just kind of want to preface before I go into our agenda that um, I think we're at a pretty interesting point historically to think about some recent advances in LGBTQ equality, especially in the last four to five years, but also um, some real concerns at the moment of um, attempts to peel back um, those advances. Um, and also an interesting point for young people who are, are seeing broader changes in society and in the world and, and feeling more safe and safe affirmed in coming out um, and coming out at earlier ages, but sometimes the broader society, societal changes that have, have let them know that they have a reason to, to feel safe and be welcomed haven't really met their microclimate around them, and sometimes that really plays out in out-of-home care settings. So I'm looking forward to 
speaking with you all today about this topic and also just let, let you know that I we have a lot of information to cover and I'm gonna go through a lot of stuff today. So I recognize it's a lot and just to let you know that we've provided some, some resources for you, um, both with links at the end of the PowerPoint and also some of the posted on the webinar screen. Um, so there's a lot to, to read and, um, and learn about later um, and I'll definitely answer some questions and I'm absolutely available as a resource um, to contact me anytime after this is over. So we'll just get into it. Let's see. Okay, great. So um, our ambitious agenda today is to do a brief overview of just some concepts and terminology so we're all on the same page about some of the terms that I'm gonna be using and kind of where things are in terms of, of language around sexual orientation, gender identity and expression. Then I'll go over in more graphic form some research and data about the experiences of LGBTQ youth both in, in society and in out of home care settings. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the particular challenges that youth face in juvenile justice settings. Uh, I'll share some of the professional standards that are out there now and also legal obligations that are, are relevant for folks working in the juvenile justice system. Um, a little bit about where things are nationally, um, both um, in terms of the federal law and also different states. And then I think the big one at the end is you know, what can you do, um, both you individually and kind of you collectively as part of the, the system that you're working in in your state or locality. So our first big category is concepts and terminology, and we could spend a whole day or possibly a semester in gender studies um, learning about all the different aspects of identity for people. So this is really gonna be just a quick crash course in some big concepts and, and some terminology. Um, there's a handout that is part of, of your, um, your resources that's a list of definitions from the American Psychological Association. So I encourage you to, encourage you to look at that later. So one of the most important things to take away in thinking about um, dimensions of identity is just that sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression are really just a piece of many, many different aspects of our, our identity. I particularly love this um, graphic from um, Allegheny County in Pennsylvania from their Department of Human Services who's been doing a lot on working with LGBTQ youth in care. Um, that just shows all the different aspects of, of who we are. And of course, these are, are working and at play sometimes very consciously for us in our experiences navigating the world based on our race, our age, our physical ability, our um, immigration status, our faith, all of those things where we live. Um, and all of us have a gender identity, a sexual orientation, and express our gender. We're going to talk a little bit about those concepts. But the idea that we all have these aspects of our identity is really critical, really critical because often LGBT people have been sort of put into an other category. Um, and being in an other category really is often kind of the root of violence and mistreatment and discrimination that somehow people who are other are not really the same, are not really people, are not really human, and so that then allows or for some people justifies mistreatment. So I think the more we can talk about everyone having a these aspects of their identity, the more it helps to understand that um, being LGBTQ is a normal aspect of, of human development and that sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression are aspects of identity we all share. So if there's one takeaway for today um, in terms of this, this crash course and uh, concepts and terminology, it's understanding these three concepts as distinct. So sexual orientation, different from gender identity, and different from gender expression. And I'll explain what each one of these means. Um, there's a number of different definitions for these concepts, so you may see those, and there's not necessarily a right one or a wrong one, um, but these are, are some ones that are, are pretty standard. Um, so sexual orientation is a person's romantic, physical, and or sexual attraction, the same sex or a different sex. So again, everyone has sexual orientation. 
and also important to delineate between just being about sex, but also being about romantic attraction to folks, because who we're attracted to and who we're in relationships with um, involves, of course, much more than who we have sex with. And this, of course, comes up a lot because sometimes you still hear people say, oh, well, you know, to a young person, your sexual orientation is not my business. I don't care who you have sex with or what you do in your bedroom doesn't matter to me, um, which really oversimplifies the aspects of, of sexual orientation. And of course, we don't hear folks say things like that to people who identify as heterosexual or straight. Um, so again, kind of minimizing the other and understanding that this is an aspect of who we all are and exists on a spectrum of attraction. So gender identity is one's um, internal sense of being male, female, or somewhere outside of this notion that we've had historically that male and female exist solely as a binary. When all of the, the research and scientists information tells us that it's actually along a spectrum. And again, um, easy to think you don't have a gender identity if your identity corresponds with the sex that you were assigned when you were born or the gender marker that you were given at the hospital and that appears on your birth certificates or other documents. But we know that for a portion of, of society, around say 2% of people, that their gender identity is actually different than the sex that they were assigned in part. And one big important consideration to think about is that your identity is the primary determinant of sex. What I mean by that is often we thought of sex as being solely defined by genitalia, but that is not what scientists and researchers tell us, that your sex is a complicated mix of chromosomes, genitalia, and identity, and the one aspect of all of those different pieces of sex is your gender identity. So regardless of what genitalia you may have or what gender marker you may have on identity documents, the thing that carries the day is your identity. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through um, the rest of the webinar. So gender expression, a separate concept, is the way a person expresses their gender through their dress, their grooming, their hair style, all kinds of ways that we express ourselves. Um, sometimes these can be unconscious. We may not be even thinking about how we groom ourselves day to day. It's just what we like and the way we are and how we've always been. Or sometimes we may actually be presenting in a way to give a signal to someone that I'm a part of this group or I belong to this particular um, tribe or part of society. I mean, an easy one is thinking about um, sports fans is like identifying yourself as you know, a Met supporter or Braves, I grew up in Georgia, um, the Atlanta Braves or whatever team you are, right? So these are different ways of expressing yourself. Um, again, for some people, this may be conscious um, or it can could just be unconscious, right? So an easy way to think about this is that a person who may identify as lesbian, so their sexual orientation, may express themselves in ways that are we associate stereotypically with males. So dress in a way that we think is more masculine depending on the cultural norms and where we grew up. Right? So that doesn't necessarily mean that that person identifies as male. She may very well identify as female, lesbian, but likes to express herself in a way that is gender non-conforming for the sex that she was assigned at birth. Similarly, a person who is a transgender female, and we'll talk about exactly what that means, may identify as heterosexual or gay or lesbian or pansexual or any one of the options for sexual orientation. So here is a graphic that I really like that the Legal Aid Society here in New York, where I live and am based, uh, developed in their LGBTQ law and policy projects. They call it SOGI SAM. Um, so we'll go through the concepts quickly. So again, gender identity is the, the, your innermost sense of being male, female, or somewhere along a non-binary spectrum. May or may not match the sex assigned at birth, right? And you may have male, female, or perhaps a small percentage of, of young people and people in general may be intersex, which we'll talk about. And then sexual orientation, 
sort of have more in the heart space that this is who you're attracted to, which can be emotionally or physically, as things may be different depending on where you are along the spectrum. And then our gender expression, again, is how we express ourselves. Um, and this is, is, of course, largely dependent on what the cultural norms are, depending on where you are and where you grew up and who's around you. So when we put all these things together, you may hear the term SOGI, and I'll probably be using it as we go along. So that's sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. So you'll most often hear it when people talk about SOGI data, which I'll go into in just a little bit. So this kind of shows the overlap, the, the final bit between sexual orientation and gender identity and expression in terms of terms people may use to describe themselves, right? So sexual orientation, we have things like questioning, um, gay, lesbian, straight, asexual, pansexual, and then transgender, non-binary, others down in our gender identity character, uh, part of the Venn diagram. And then in the middle, we have terms like queer, which may mean different things to different people and may be kind of a combination of someone discussing their identity in terms of their gender and their sexual orientation. So next we're actually going to talk about some of the words that some people use to describe themselves. And this is part of our, our acronym that we always see. So lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, gender, queer or questioning, questioning intersex, intersex, asexual or ally, and then two-spirit. So just to go through a few of these, we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to be transgender in more detail later. But folks have often heard queer as a pejorative or negative term, but a lot more young people and some adults are really have sort of taken back that term and are actually um, embracing it and again, maybe using it in different ways. So if a young person says, you know, hey, I identify as queer, a great thing you can say after thanking them for trusting you with that information um, is to ask them what that means because it may mean different things for different people. The I for intersex is a term that describes um, Different makeup of, of sex characteristics could be genitalia, could be a mix of, of male and female chromosomes, but someone who isn't necessarily um, in a terms of genetic makeup and sometimes um, physical aspects of, of their sex um, um, falls into intersex category. That's slightly different than the others because it's actually um, a medical condition. So an ally for A is somebody who is not part of the LGBT community, but actually is an advocate for members within it. And two-spirit, 2S, two is a term that some Native American communities have used to describe folks who may fall along the transgender spectrum. It's not necessarily used by all, but in some, at least historically, it's sort of more of a revered status, and it's still used in some tribes. To back up um, a little bit, um, Gay, you may hear both to describe males who are attracted to other males or as sort of a term for both males and females um, who have same-sex attraction. Right? All right, so skip ahead. Um, another example, um, just to kind of help clarify, is a person who is intersex, right, who was, has this medical condition at birth um, and may then have um, any gender identity. May identify as male, they may identify as female, or they may identify as non-binary. So in terms of helping to understand if you don't identify as transgender, how someone's um, sex assigned at birth could be different than their gender identity, sometimes it's helpful to think about that for intersex folks who may not necessarily have um, a determined sex of male or female at birth, but may have that identity somewhere along the spectrum male or female or non-binary. We currently have a case, Lambda Legal does, a, a person who is intersex and identifies as non-binary. We tried to get a passport, and the State Department is requiring them to either check male or female, and they can't and don't identify along that binary. So the judge has ordered the State Department to comply and develop an X gender marker for passports, but it has yet to happen. So along the non-binary, I think more and more youth are are using these, um, are identifying as non-binary and 
realizing they don't really fall neatly into MRF boxes. And so it's, these are some terms that you may hear some of those youth um, use to describe themselves. So I think I'm going to stop right here, and we're going to do a, a few poll questions um, just to see all of you that are on the webinar, uh, how many of you have been working with young people who may identify across these different categories? So if we can do our first poll question. So in the past year, have you worked with a youth that is lesbian, gay, or bisexual? That includes right now if you're working with someone. So right now or in the past year, have you worked with a youth that is lesbian, gay, or bisexual identified? Yes or no? I'll give a second for everybody to answer. Everybody to answer. Okay, I can okay. see the, the numbers as they're coming in. We'll wait for everybody to, um, I have a couple more minutes to post them, but so far it looks like about 80% of you have been working with a young person who identifies as lesbian, gay, or bisexual within the past year. So that's, that's pretty phenomenal and I think says a lot. Um, so if you want to move to the next question. Okay, so in the past year, have you worked with a transgender youth? So a young person that identifies differently than the sex that they were assigned at birth. At birth. So either currently or in the last year. Okay, so I think we're at about 80%, a little more, of folks who voted, and 55% of you, 54% um, said yes. So I think that is really just a, a, a sort of a sea change, really, from what we would have heard maybe even two, three years ago, right, of just much more visibility in the world about transgender people and youth understanding of their experiences. Um, that they may fall into that category or identify in that way. Um, and I think also these numbers kind of reflect, right, the, the statistics about the population in general and our numbers in general, right, if they're only being, um, you know, one to two percent of young people that identify as transgender. Um, but also I think reflects a big um, overrepresentation of trans youth in care, which we'll talk about in just a second. Okay, our final question along these lines, we'll put up that poll. Okay, so this one is our other category we were talking about. So in the last year or now, have you worked with a youth who identifies as genderqueer, non-binary, or something other than male or female? Any of those, any of those varieties of, of gender expansive youth? Okay, so we've hit our 80% our mark, and so far 21% of you have said that, yes, you have worked with a youth who identifies somehow along the, the gender expansive or non-binary spectrum. So, um, again, I think that's pretty telling about um, the number of youth now who are feeling like they don't fit into the binary. Um, and again, I think it's a smaller percentage in the general population. Um, so thanks a lot for filling out those. All right, we'll go right, back to the PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Okay, so um, 
again, uh, I think the the really great thing about um, terminology, uh, even though it can seem really daunting to keep up, is that basically it's nearly impossible to keep up. Um, I work for an LGBT civil rights organization, and I learned something new about how people identify and terms that they use to, to describe themselves every day. every day. So a really great thing to do is just, of course, allow the young person to self-identify when ready. And, and we'll talk about things that you all can do to telegraph that you're a safe person and the environment you're in is safe for them to disclose and why that's important. Um, but then when they do to mirror the language that they use, and if you're not sure what it means, to ask in a respectful way what it means to them, um, which allows them to define themselves and the terms that they're using, um, and also opens up a conversation between you and the young people, young person, so you can better understand them. Um, obviously, some young people are going to be identifying in ways or expressing themselves and may not have a term or a label or even want one. Um, so in talking about terminology, our goal isn't to label people or to require them to have a label, but for a lot of folks, it means something um, to be considered part of a group or to feel like where they fit into the world to decide for themselves if they want to use one of these terms to describe themselves. And, and finally, um, we know that know adolescents, that. and I'm sure you all see this every, every day in your work, um, are, are constantly shifting. Um, part of, of normal adolescent development is figuring out who you are, who you like, who you love. Um, where you fit into the world, and so identity is really fluid, which is where that questioning word is often used to describe adolescent, adolescent in particular, who may be going through this normal stage of development. So again, that was really a fast <laughs> overview of a lot of these terms, and we certainly didn't go over all of them, um, but check out the, the APA document, which has a list of terms, and there are a bunch of bunch different sources out there for terms of and language people use to describe themselves. One thing before we move from this that I'll mention is there are some terms that um, I hear folks use often who are really, I think, trying to be very well-meaning, um, but might be off-putting to some young people or adults that you're working with. And one is lifestyle. Um, um, the reason that can be a little off-putting for some LGBT people is because Really, sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression, as we discussed, are aspects of identity. identity. There isn't there. one particular lifestyle that LGBT people live, and oftentimes LGBT people have heard that in a very negative or pejorative context, even if the person who's saying it doesn't mean that way at all. So if you hear people use that or you have and you see someone kind of flinch a little bit, that may be why. Um, as one of my colleagues used to say, um, our being is a lifestyle, but sexual orientation and rights and the expression are part of, of who we all are. Um, in terms of, of transgender, using that term, oftentimes people say, oh, that person was born a girl or born a boy or that's their biological sex was male or is male or is female. Um, and again, I think a lot of trans people will say, you know, I knew from a very, very early age that my identity did not correspond with the sex a doctor assigned me. Um, so being born a boy or born a girl wasn't really my experience um, at all. And we also talked about how um, a person's sex is really a complicated mix of things and gender identity is the, the defining factor. So saying someone's biological sex was what they were assigned at birth based simply on a doctor looking at their genitalia um, is really kind of inaccurate. Um, and I mention a lot of the, the terms and these guidelines um, not to be um, the sort of political correctness police, um, but if our goal in all of these systems is really to make sure that the young people that we're working with know that we're here for them and we support them and we are supportive of their identity and who they are, um, being mindful of of language is really helpful because again it sends a message that that we get it or at least that we care even if we don't necessarily get it right the first time or, or know everything um, and we'll talk a little bit later about how um, affirmation of identity for transgender youth is actually really critical to their well-being so um, 
again, not about um, about political correctness or, or making people um, comply with a whole set of rules, but just about being mindful that language is often a sign of respect. And I think in many aspects of our lives, we can all relate to um, how language can make us feel um, if we feel like it's meant in a disrespectful way. So happy to take any questions about that towards the end, but we'll move quickly into some research and data. Um, I'm not gonna show you today a whole lot of the actual numbers and statistics around LGBTQ youth. There is an attachment that has resources for LGBTQ youth and lists a ton of different reports and studies that have a lot of the actual statistics in it. Um, um, pretty much sum up the statistics across the board in saying that unfortunately LGBTQ youth and particularly transgender youth and non-binary youth still really bear a lot of brunt of societal stigma and prejudice. So that plays yeah, out that plays experiences out. around bullying at school, violence in the community, discrimination in housing and employment. I mean, all of these things are still pretty bad, even though they're getting, they are in fact getting better. Um, and the critical part, I think, is just to understand that a lot of that discrimination is not just a legal consideration, but also really impacts well-being. So we're seeing more and more research about experiencing racism or expending gender bias or experiencing discrimination based on your sexual orientation is really harmful to your well-being and manifests itself in many different ways. We've, in both child welfare and juvenile justice, have really had some important conversations about trauma and thinking about trauma-informed care. And discrimination based on identity can certainly be both emotional trauma and sometimes physical trauma or abuse based on who you are, and that includes family rejection, which we'll talk about. Um, so I'll, I'll just show you um, kind of a little bit graphically how this sort of plays out. So I'm sure many of you, you know, working in these systems can sort of look at this cycle that I have on the screen and think, well, like, hey, I, I work with non-LGBTQ youth that this cycle applies to in terms of, of going through various systems and having their negative experiences that result in, result in an interaction with out-of-home care systems. But for LGBTQ youth, this can kind of be on steroids. If you've been kicked out at home, end up in foster care, don't have an affirming caseworker, and are simultaneously being bullied at school and have been suspended or expelled, then you may not necessarily have an, an advocate. Um, especially if maybe your attorney or guardian of Latimer Casa um, isn't affirming. You may not have an advocate there, and that could be a funnel into the juvenile justice system. Or if you're a 16 and 17-year-old and you've been kicked out of home um, and not picked up by the child welfare system and are left in sort of a legal void where your parents won't consent to medical care that you need or reporting you as a runaway for staying at a, a supportive friend's house, um, all of those things, right? Or if you're being bullied at school and lash out and have an assault charge, you may go directly into the juvenile justice system or you're engaging in some sort of survival crime because you're homeless. And then in terms of additional factors, if you're undocumented um, or if you're a young person of color, right? All of these things can really um, end up kind of being um, cycling out in terms of of higher and higher rates of involvement in these various out-of-home care systems. So it's important to recognize that they can kind of have a domino effect with lack of affirmation and support for LGBT youth. So we often have folks say, well, how many do we have? Like, what are the numbers of kids that we have in care? Um, we're gonna talk about data a little bit later, but historically, we really haven't had a lot of great numbers. and. I think you probably all understand some of the reasons why, um, but partly it's just because, at least in terms of government systems, I think advocates and others have felt really conflicted about having folks ask, because in a lot of systems, there haven't been explicit protections from discrimination, people haven't been trained, there's still a lot of stigma and prejudice violence and harassment that youth face. So the prospect of proactively asking young people really has been sort of fraught with peril because we don't want to ask coming from a good place, but inadvertently have youth exposed to discrimination or mistreatment. 
Um, but in the last few years, last we've had some studies. Um, this one um, is in Los Angeles County for youth and foster care. It was funded by the Administration of Children, Youth, and Families um, as part of the RISE project. It was done by the Williams Institute. So they surveyed over 700 kids in foster care and 19.1% identified as LGBTQ, which is about twice or a little over estimates in the general population. And then 19, and then, I'm sorry, 5.6% of those 19.1 identified as transgender, which is a pretty whopping overrepresentation if we think there are about one to 2% in the general population. And I would say that our poll numbers, I think kind of from today, pretty accurately reflected, I think, what that that disproportionate number in, in juvenile justice. So unfortunately, we also know that young know, people who are in child welfare settings um, have a higher rate of homelessness. And for LGBTQ youth, it kind of takes on, um, again, that sort of next level of if we don't have services designed to promote family acceptance, kids end up placed in out-of-home care at higher rates if we don't have affirming uh, or work to make sure can are affirming and can be placements. We end up in foster care. If we don't have an affirming array of placements, we end up in group homes. Group home. If those aren't safe, kids run or get pushed out or get bullied, end up in the shelter system, or just sort of vote with their feet and decide to take you know matters on their own um, and end up homelessness. And as we sort of go down the scale, scale of permanency from home to adoption to guardianship, then we have a ton of young people, unfortunately, that are homeless. So this 40% numbers, some studies estimate that 40% of youth experiencing homelessness identify as LGBTQ, which is really a shocking number. I think indicating that some youth are, are being pushed out of home and not being picked up by systems and some that are, are exiting these systems to homelessness. So also we know that um, there are all kinds of, um, of pipelines into the criminal justice system. We've had a lot of attention um, to the school to prison pipeline, which statistically affects LGBTQ youth, particularly LGBTQ youth of color at higher rates. But we also know that there's, if you're in foster care, you have a higher rate of juvenile justice involvement if you're homeless. And also if you're a person of color um, sort of existing in the world, right? Um, so if we think, for example, of uh, a transgender girl, African American, right, may be experiencing all of these pipelines simultaneously or at different points of her life. And that has kind of led to for some reason I can't advance the slide now. There we go. Um, has led to an overrepresentation in the juvenile justice system. So you can see some of these studies that were done by Angela Irvine in California. Um, I'll just note that um, out of the youth in juvenile justice facilities, 85% are youth of color. So I think that's relevant for us in a lot of different ways. If our efforts to reduce the disproportionate minority contact in the system aren't thinking about LGBTQ youth of color and how they fit into this picture, they're they're clearly not really getting at the full picture of what's going on. And also, if we think back to that identity slide for LGBTQ youth of color, you may be experiencing um, a big brunt of a lot of, of racism and, and bigotry that exists in our society still, and also our negative experiences at times with, with law enforcement and the justice system. So um, um, this study does have a couple of slides that I think are, are interesting to think about in terms of, of your work. So this is a study done um, in New York about the experiences of LGBTQ youth um, engaged in survival sex. Um, it was a youth participatory design model. So young people were referred to other young people who had had experiences engaging in survival sex. Survival sex. Um, um, so. So the living situation of the young people, 48% were in a shelter, and then you see 10% street, 10% friend's home. Um, so indicate a lot of young people who are being displaced or not in a home or their own place, right? And then, and then interesting to think about their arrests um, and what they were arrested for. So if you see sort of way down at 9% is actually prostitution. So Obviously, I think we know, but I, this really illustrates that some of the young people we're seeing that 
you know, fall into the federal definition of trafficking. You're not appearing in prostitution related charges, but having other interactions that may be related to homelessness or engaging in survival sex or just conflict in the world in general. Um, so right now I want to play a, a clip um, from StoryCorps, audio clip. So the, you'll hear the person on the right, Darnell Moore, who's going to be talking about an experience um, he had when he was a child. I um, often I just have to um, really kind of not listen to that because it is um, so difficult to hear and uh, think about Darnell, you know, having this experience where you know he easily could have been killed or um, or suffered you know, you know very serious burns. But um, I think it's helpful for us to to kind of think about the experience of of young people um, really as kind of separated in some sense of, of how they actually identify or even if they are at a point where they can articulate a word or, or, or term for it um because at that point in time um you know darnell was really just describing him as a nerd or preacher's son and so the presumption of the the young people who you know who did this awful thing to him was that he was gay because of how he was um, expressing himself. So back to our kind of through line of thinking about a gender expression um, as its own kind of category and how a lot of the discrimination and mistreatment and, and violence that LGBTQ people suffer um, and others that aren't but are perceived to be is really because their expression is fitting into a category that is considered non-conforming. Um, and that makes them different or other or not acceptable. And of course, just depends on where you are and the circumstances where you grew up.
the, the other thing that I think is really phenomenal about um, Darnell's description of his story is it's very much from like a kid's perspective, even though he's telling it uh, as an adult of noticing that adults around him um, had had seen people bullying him, had not done anything about it, and he noticed that, right? Which is really telling, I think, for all of our work with young people who are in our care um, that they understand, especially if they're in facilities or group homes or out of home care, that the adults there are actually responsible for their safety and sometimes complicit in them not being safe if they don't speak out and say something, um, even if it's you know peer to peer, right? As in the situation, and not um, staff or, or professionals seeing young people. Um, and finally, I think hearing him talk about how he really just wanted to um, be this young person's friend and still couldn't understand why someone would do this to him, um, I think is also really telling and thinking about that as adults, we have often a really hard time and significant impact from people treating us unfairly or discriminating against us or being violent to us. But as a kid, it's a whole different matter to try to process um, where this fits in and what it means to you. So um, I think that that I appreciate him sharing this story because I think it's really instructive with us in terms of, of working with young people. With young people. Okay, so next um, we're talking about some particular challenges for LGBT youth in juvenile justice settings. So this is kind of a it is time to sort of put some of these challenges into different categories or buckets. So there's there's a lot of really great research out there about um, how being isolated, um, particularly around not being able to share who you are, um, really has negative health consequences. So if a young person is not able to feel safe and share who they are, that really increases our negative outcomes such as um, sexually transmitted infections, depression, substance use, all of those things. So thinking about what I mentioned earlier, like saying, well, this is sort of none of my business, um, what your sexual orientation or gender identity is. Um, really, it is our business because we are actually in work of trying to make sure that young people are successful and having healthy youth development. So whatever we can do to make sure that in these systems they can fully be themselves is going to help with their well-being and their success and their rehabilitation and their well-being. Um, victimization um, obviously takes on um, a different aspects, aspect right, from emotional abuse or harm, um, pejorative names, um, suppressing identity is a form of emotional harm, and then of course physical victimization. Um, some of my clients who've been in juvenile justice settings have been assaulted repeatedly in facilities to the point of hospitalization, and that has been motivated um, sometimes very overtly in terms of names or calling or bashing because of who they are. Um, and obviously we, I know we all share the value of wanting to keep young people safe. Um, and differential treatment, again, can be um, different rules applying because of who you are. Um, this really, I think, comes to a head in a lot of our custodial settings because they are still very much sex segregated and Part of, that Part of that segregation has been a presumption that folks are safety are safer because we have males and females um, separated, and that you know present, prevents um, relationships, hanky panky, like whatever you want to call it, right? Of young people like engaging in behavior that um, um, we don't want them to, or they shouldn't in those sorts of settings. But really, that kind of presumes that. Um, this heteronormative environment that young people aren't attracted to people of the same sex, so therefore we segregate them by sex, or that, or that we're putting folks in the right place based on what sex that they were assigned at birth. So this can really result in differential treatment of, you know, having a youth uh, be violated or not obtain the same level in the treatment program because they have said another youth was cute or they've tried to hold hands with another youth when. Um, you know, contact is prohibited, right? Understand that we have rules around keeping people safe, but sometimes those rules have a disparate or different effect on young people when we have these sex segregated environments and they don't fit neatly into our presumptions about how everyone identifies in those settings. Um, disclosure dilemmas and confidentiality violations are, are kind of related. So by disclosure dilemmas, we mean 
what a young person is going through, the stress or anxiety of feeling like whether they can disclose to you. One of my clients, I mean, he was released from parole, um, was very anxious about meeting with her parole officer because she didn't know if she was going to have conflict or trouble around getting her probation officer to refer to her using the name that she uses in pronouns. Um, and when the parole officer was um, responsive and affirming, um, she characterized it as really being able just to move on, that she was able to focus on what she needed to do and not have to focus her energies on you know, having a battle or, or trying to convince this person of, of who she was and was able to get on with the business of completing probation, which she did successfully. Um, um, but, but a lot of stress and anxiety in thinking about that because young people, you know, if they don't have some signs, are really trying to navigate whether um, the people they disclose to may be affirming or not. Um, confidentiality violations may be having someone out you to other folks that could be parents. If, you know, as a probation officer or staff, you're the first person a young person is disclosed to. So, um, you know, part of the policy component, we'll talk about it in a sec, is just about having particular protocols for how to manage that information and to make sure that if we're sharing, it's because we're doing it to connect a young person with services, we're doing it to help assist them versus gossiping or, or more importantly, disclosing when we don't know if a youth has disclosed, say to family or others, because that may put them in an unsafe situation. Um, lack of family-centered services, think about back to the slide I showed about the LGBTQ youth kind of child welfare to homelessness pipeline. We know from a lot of research from the Family Acceptance Project in particular that young people who have experienced really high levels of rejection from parents have just off the charts off negative the charts. Um, public health outcomes, right? And providing some information about families to help move them in a place of acceptance can really reduce those bad numbers. It doesn't mean that you have to get every parent to the point of being on a pride float, um, even just dropping that to moderately reject a place where parents are um, willing to listen and not um, saying they disown a youth or they wish they were never born, those kinds of really severe rejection. Just reducing it a little bit really helps. And obviously this affects stability um, in life in general and well-being. So, so if you don't know of a, a resource in your community, it's worth talking to others about cultivating one or reaching out to folks within the LGBT community to see if you have someone who can help work with families in terms of thinking about the way their behaviors may be impacting um, their young person's, their child's well-being. So finally is a lack of competency among providers. So oftentimes, especially when young people are in the community, we're referring them to services, whether it's vocational training or counseling or all sorts of things like that. And we really have no idea often whether the providers we're sending them to are competent in working with LGBT young people. And so sometimes the lack of success may be because the experience of going to that provider is really terrible. Um, and you know, it may be challenging to, to meet the list of, of items you're supposed to do anyway for a variety of reasons. And if that's a negative experience, um, it's certainly not gonna be helpful in, in moving towards positive development. Okay, let's see, next. Um, um, so um, again, thinking about transgender youth, so um, youth who identify differently than the sex that they were assigned at birth, right? Um, transgender is both an umbrella term and then a term that we can use as an adjective to describe a transgender girl who is someone who is assigned sex of male at birth but identifies as female, or vice versa, right? So the, the, the major takeaway here is that um, being able to express yourself with your name, your clothing, um, being able to do a, whatever transition suits you, is helpful for you, is critical to your safety and well-being. So I often hear from folks that, well, like this is sort of complicated. We don't do that. I don't know about the parents, so you can just wait till you're 18. Um, and unfortunately, that's not an approach that any of the professionals in social science organizations or researchers or psychologists say is a good one. Um, because we know that providing an environment of affirmation and letting youth be themselves actually helps them be healthy and well and more stable and more productive and have better development um, and public health outcomes, right? So everything we should do should be centered in that. 
Um, so that includes allowing you to use the name that they use, pronouns, express themselves, and critically having qualified medical and behavioral health care, um, and being placed in accord with their identity if that's what the youth wants to do. Um, a lot of places are doing some really good work on allowing youth to be placed in accord with their identity, which I'll talk about um, in a little bit. Um, and obviously trans youth can, you know, even outside of facilities or detention settings, have some real challenges, right, in school and being affirmed. So we'll hear a clip in just a second about that, um, or just in, in the world in general. Um, so there's one of your documents that I've attached as a resource um, is a study that just came out about um, even just using a name for a young person that they use um, has really positive impacts in terms of their well-being. Um, so sometimes you hear people say, well, like we can't just let you, you know, choose a name and what if they use a gang name or what if they use something else? Um, and it emphasizes that's a very different situation for a young person who may like a nickname or use a nickname than a young person who is using a name that reflects their identity. Um, again, that's something that's critical for their well-being. Um, another question that comes up a lot is, well, don't I have a court document that has a legal name and don't I have to use it? Um, say yes, probably for a caption in a, in a court document, but I haven't really seen anywhere where there's actually a rule or any sort of written policy that says you can only use the legal name um, in the detention setting or in personal interactions or in report. So we recommend using the first name the youth uses, putting their legal first name in parentheses and using their last name and using the name they use throughout or even saying formerly known as, but um, AKA often has kind of some negative criminal connotations at times um, or may indicate fraud or something else. So, Really try to stick away, try to stay away from that. Um, so the, the critical part of the medical and mental health services is to make sure that the folks that you're working with, whether it's an informal referral for therapy or the psychologist or psychiatrist that's working with you at your facility, um, are really skilled and qualified. Or if not, they've reached out to folks who are, um, so they are appropriately diagnosed with you. Um, it used to be that uh, gender identity disorder was a diagnosis in the DSM that reflected someone having um, a hard time or negative experiences around um, their identity and society's reaction to it um, and sort of collateral health consequences from that. Uh, now it's gender dysphoria. It's a diagnosis to reflect that this isn't in fact a disorder or anything wrong with you, but you still might be experiencing significant stress and trauma around um, a society's reaction or your experiences in the world as a trans person. Um, that gender dysphoria diagnosis is usually something that's necessary to begin um, cross-hormone therapy or puberty blockers. Um, again, again, a lot of the, lot of the information the from clients that I've had and in, in reading records from facilities is um, really having folks understand that a young person is asking or requesting um, to use a different name than their legal one or asking to wear clothing that reflects their identity, but staff not recognizing or even asking if that's how a person identifies. Um, and then going from there or having an evaluation that are looking at a whole bunch of different things, but kind of to some extent missing the elephant in the living room. Um, and again, even though there may be some legal hurdles to work through in terms of, of getting parental consent or having a youth access um, hormones in a facility, for example, um, having a young person be able to pursue whatever health care they are um, and having a doctor recommend that as medically necessary um, is pretty critical to the young person's well-being and safety. So it's something that um, that system should be pursuing. So I talked a little bit about the setting, uh, some de detention um, and facility related things, but, but really these challenges sort of present themselves across multiple settings. So again, sometimes um, LGBT young people, because of their gender non-conforming experiences are, or experiencing homelessness are having um, negative interactions with law enforcement um, in a number of places like Cincinnati, Philadelphia, some other places, police forces have been like, really been um, working with the LGBT community and understanding how they can um, 
interact in a positive and affirming way while still doing their jobs. Atlanta has a detailed LGBTQ policy, um, as well as New York and other places. Um, at intake and diversion, and when we talk about data in a second, I think this is really helpful to think about if young people are not um, engaging in serious offenses or having um, offenses that are related to conflict or discrimination um, in society at large or in their family, um, those are young people that can be served um, um, outside of facilities for sure and, and also um, really getting what they need in the community um, versus having to go deeper into the system. Um, you know, some of the things we've talked about in terms of detention and facilities are, of course, present in group homes or congregate care. Um, and then probation or parole, um, mentioned the example of my client and thinking about, again, um, how experiences at school or in family or um, interactions with probation or parole um, may negatively impact young people. Um, and that goes to, of course, for reentry. Um, working some, uh, particularly in folks who are working with the New Jersey Juvenile Justice Commission, a lot of folks said they had young people call after they went home, after they were, were released from the facility and said, you know, you were really supportive of me and I just want to let you know that um, I'm having a real hard time with my family. They're not accepting of me and now I have no place to go. Um, so thinking about what that interaction is going to look like when kids are released can really help reduce um, recidivism and make sure young people are successful. So just briefly, I want to mention um, kind of where we are with professional standards. Um, so all of these organizations have basically say what, you know, it's kind of a no-brainer that um, LGBTQ youth should not be discriminated against and in fact should be affirmed and supported. Um, so uh, not really a difficult concept, but I think an example where um, sometimes our systems have sort of lagged behind um, what all the professionals who have anything to say about what's good for kids say. So these are just a, a few, um, and I'll give you a couple of specific examples. So the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, um, position statement on trans youth in juvenile and correctional settings, no discrimination based on gender identity, house all youth consistent with their identity if they define it, and provide youth with psychiatric and medical care consistent with national standards. Um, and then this from the American Psychological Association, um, talking about um, how important it is to have young people connected with medical care providers who can recommend um, medically necessary care for them and following that and how critical that is, again, to a young person's well-being. Um, there's a fact sheet from the APA that talks about gender identity in adolescence as part of your materials that's really, really helpful kind of summary. Right? And, and some people um, sort of ask, well, like, how do you know, um, how can we be sure, those sorts of things. Um, and sometimes you hear, and they mention this in the APA fact sheet, about um, uh, persistent, consistent, and insistent. So there isn't a, a test, of course, for whether someone's trans, if they identify that way, that's it. <laughs> But, um, you know, when, when medical and behavioral health professionals are kind of working, looking with youth, they look to see whether this has been something that has been consistent over time, whether it's insistent, whether it's persistent. Um, and again, that may sort of fluctuate for young people developmentally. Um, but also, I think, helpful to think about that we don't really question young people who identify as cisgender or the same as they do as the sex they were assigned at birth, we never question whether they are sure or whether they know that they in fact identify as male or female. Or, um, but we often question um, transgender youth about whether they're really sure. sure. Um, so, and in well, the beginning of 2017, um, the Federal Advisory Committee on Juvenile Justice issued the recommendations of its official um, adopted and issued the recommendations of its LGBTQ subcommittee, um, which are um, on a link at the end of the PowerPoint, um, so you can take a look at them. But here's sort of a summary. Basically, again, have non-discrimination policies, um, affirmation of identity, access to providers, community support, training, et cetera. Um, so those were sent to OJDP um, for OJDP to follow up with the state. Um, so they provide a really great roadmap in thinking about um, what your state system should look like. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, enormous detail here, um, but I would be slightly remiss as a lawyer working 
for a civil rights organization if I didn't talk to you a little bit about the Constitution um, and uh, federal and state law. Um, so there have really been some pretty significant advances in terms of, of cases um, out there talking about LGBT people um, and to some degree youth. Um, and really, even if there aren't explicit protections in your state or system or in particular juvenile justice law or the code, um, young people in custodial settings um, and just in general in the world, of course, have constitutional rights. Um, and those are kind of uh, up a notch when you are in custodial settings. So in terms of, of due process, you have a right to dignity, you have a right to liberty, um, particularly when you are under government control, um, you have a right to be treated equitably. So if, for example, you are providing recommended health care to a young person who is not transgender, um, and yet and you're not providing health care to a young person related to their gender identity, that could be an equal protection violation. If young people aren't allowed to express themselves to their clothing, their hairstyle, all of those are, are treated differently in terms of how the rules apply because of being who they are, LGBT, that could be a problem with your right to free expression. Um, I've had, had clients who have been told by therapists in custodial, custodial settings they're going to hell because they're LGBT. Um, even though they have a right to be free from religion and to, to um, express their faith or not. Um, if you're not providing medical care, um, that could very well be a, a violation of prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment under the 8th and 14th Amendment. Um, so I just mentioned all these to say that, um, you know, I, I think our fundamental um, understanding of, of doing right by LGBT youth is based on social science and doing everything we know we can to help make sure youth are successful. But it's also good to be aware of legal obligations. Um, the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act and Omnibus Crime Control Act both have non-discrimination provisions that include a prohibition of discrimination on account of sex. Um, and more and more federal courts are interpreting discrimination on account of sex as including discrimination based on gender identity and gender expression. Um, of course, there's the Prison Rape Elimination Act, um, which you know, many, many juvenile justice systems have done a lot of work on. Um, I will mention that in terms of the placement of trans youth in accordance with their identity, as many of you I'm sure are familiar, that's kind of left as a case-by-case -case exception. But really we've seen a lot of places just never have that case-by-case -case evaluation result in a trans youth placed in accordance with their identity. Um, and, and I think then it sort of become the exception that eats the rule rather than really um, thinking about how we should be um, framing it up, which is that allowing that youth to be affirmed in all aspects of their identity, including placement, um, is really what's best for them. Um, obviously, this is you know, dependent on what the youth wants, but I think oftentimes we have, as systems, not created a safe space and then left the youth with basically no choice but to correctly evaluate that being placed in accordance with their identity may not be safe for them when systems haven't done um, enough to make sure that it can be or is. Um, Priya has um, really resulted in a lot of training and information about working with LGBT people, um, but I will say that I think Priya is a great um, floor, but certainly not the ceiling and that it's important to think about LGBT youth and their needs as more than just victims, even though they do, of course, statistically are at a much higher rate of victimization in custodial settings. Um, so other aspects of federal law, like Title IX, if there's educational programs, um, prohibit discrimination on account of sex and the Affordable Care Act, if um, a young person is in a residential treatment facility, there are protections there against discrimination um, based on gender identity. So all these may apply. Um, here's just some quotes from um, a couple of um, one case we've been involved in and the, the uh, trans military ban challenge. Um, and then the big case, the big um, juvenile justice case out of Hawaii, that I think is important to note that the facility there didn't have policies or training necessary to protect LGBT youth, adequate staffing or supervision, a functioning grievance system, or an adequate classification system. And so the judge found at a preliminary injunction stage that um, 
there were violations of youth's constitutional rights who had experienced pretty pervasive and awful discrimination. Um, so you'll see a couple of other quotes from some case law, and then this one from uh, a recent decision by a federal judge in Puerto Rico in one of our cases challenging um, their policy of refusing people to allow uh, the ability to amend their gender on birth certificates. Um, so I think this quote is just pretty phenomenal in terms of recognizing um, how our structure and the law is oftentimes just kind of completely at odds with people just trying to be themselves and and really to just be better and, and safer and um, you know, not have horrible, horrible um, incidences of, of self-harm and suicidal ideation and these things. And, and we can do a lot to help alleviate those awful outcomes. Um, so state law may also, of course, apply to state constitution, um, particular provisions in the juvenile code about you know, your obligation to provide health care. Um, public accommodations law may apply to government services or kids are in group homes. So all of these are considerations to keep in mind. Um, also licensing often comes into play um, and the use of the term sex or gender there. Um, so what we found in a report I'll, I'll um, turn you, direct you to um, in just a second is that um, folks often think that uh, these licensing regulations present a barrier to placing trans youth in accordance with their identity, but in the vast majority of places, sex or gender isn't even defined. So people are just substituting their own idea of what that means, and sometimes meaning sex or gender assigned at birth. So um, sex or gender often appears in language and regulation about clothing, supervision, searches, sometimes training, um, admissions. Um, so if you're encountering that as somebody saying that's a barrier, definitely ask them to see what they're citing to, and I'm happy to to be a resource to helping navigate those waters. Those waters. So just briefly, to, um, we have a map up on our website. You can see the link there. Um, the the states in purple have LGBT-specific statewide policies, which is definitely the standard that we hope everyone uh, reaches, and I'll talk about why in a sec. So 18 states have those, um, and D.C. Um, nine additional states somewhere in law or policy have sexual orientation and gender identity as protected classes. Twelve states, sexual orientation and sex. Eight states, just sex only as a protected class. And then three states, Alaska, North Carolina, and Oklahoma, don't have any explicit protections that we could find, although um, I know folks in Alaska are having conversations about this and also in, um, in North Carolina. Um, so a reason to have an LGBTQ specific um, statewide policy um, is really to make sure there's clarity for folks about the fact that you can't discriminate and exactly what it means to discriminate based on sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, the policies provide terms and definitions. They ban any sort of conversion therapy, which is shown to be particularly damaging and ineffective. Um, no disparagement, have particular process about making sure that youth are safe and housed appropriately, um, having, again, competent care providers, providers. Um, having specific language that trans youth are to be um, referred by the name that they use, the pronouns, allowed to express themselves, establishing a, an education and grievance process, talking about confidentiality, requiring training, and significantly making sure that youth are connected to affirming supports, um, both while they're in facilities or when they're in the community. Um, all of that stuff I just went over really quickly is in the Safe Havens report um, that we put together, which is um, a link at the end that you can check out. Um, so in our last piece, I want to play a quick video um, from uh, Gavin Grimm. Um, so Gavin was a plaintiff in a uh, challenge by the ACLU to um, how Gavin was being treated in school in terms of restroom access consistent with his gender identity. So this is Gavin testifying at his school board hearing. 
Okay, I think we may have had um, some folks who had trouble hearing um, Gavin's audio. So I, sorry if you weren't able to, to hear everything. You can definitely um, just Google Gavin Grimm, ACLU school board hearing to check it out. So I apologize if you couldn't hear it. I, I could, but maybe some of you couldn't. Um, so um, Gavin, of course, was talking about his experiences in school. Um, just to emphasize that um, obviously, if you're in uh, congregate care, which is a term I use, I know someone had a question about, so like group homes, basically any kind of, of setting where you have multiple youth living in one place, um, that, that basically you are then, by and large, like completely under the control in terms of, of where you sleep, where you use the restroom, oftentimes clothes that you wear um, in custody and sort of affirmation of identity, again, is pretty critical there. But also wanted to play Gavin's clip really to demonstrate that you know, by our poll surveys, you know, 80% of you are working with LGBT and LGBT, excuse me, identified youth and, and over half of you with trans youth. And you know, young people, if we're approaching them in a safe and affirming manner, can really tell us a lot about how they should be um, treated in custodial settings and how we can work with them more effectively. Um, in the Safe Havens report that I, I mentioned, um, we have some tips from youth who were affirmed in aspects of their care, um, some in foster care, some in juvenile justice, um, others in shelters for youth experiencing homelessness. Um, so we've covered some of these, but um, I think really thinking about how our work at increasing positive youth engagement and involvement and systemic reform has often not included LGBTQ youth and they can be you know, a really, really important provider. Um, Barrett here said a really great one, which is don't gender things. Like sometimes we just have been in a habit or practice of gendering everything when really there may not be a good reason for that while recognizing that, you know, girls and boys can have different experiences and recognizing that, um, but then those things are not mutually exclusive. Also in the report, we have um, profiles and tips from providers. One of those was juvenile detention here in New York City who has um, developed uh, SOGI questions at intake when coming into detention, has been placing youth in accordance with their identities and really done a lot of training and ongoing coaching. Um, so they're, I'm sure, available as a resource for all of you. Um, a couple of other uh, providers, foster care agency in Atlanta, family acceptance program in Detroit, so definitely check those out. Um, a lot of people have questions about whether to affirmatively ask about sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, and I think if we can get there by establishing these building blocks of, of having non-discrimination policy, confidentiality protocol, training and coaching, that we have a ton of benefits that can come from that. Of, of knowing our numbers, we know how evidence-based and data-driven things are. Um, more experiences about, um, more information about experiencing care out of care, tracking recidivism. I mean, there's a ton of reasons. Um, and also, I think a lot of our classification has really been about kind of deciding for ourselves based on external expression or signs of whether someone is LGBT or not, rather than asking them, which is the only way we really know. So if we can get to this place, um, it would be great. Um, Angela Irvine, who's with Impact Justice, has been a leading researcher on this. Um, and there are opportunities to work with her and impact justice and thinking about data collection. And then also um, Georgetown Center for Juvenile Justice Reform is doing an LGBTQ certification program, which uh, some of you from some of your states have been doing and they're doing it again this year. So those are great ways to get at some of these, uh, these questions. So what can you do um, to finish up before we take questions? Um, collaborate. I would say we've, we've seen great success in having local jurisdictions and, and statewide having LGBTQ youth and out of home care work groups. Um, so inviting folks from school, juvenile justice, child welfare, runaway and homeless youth providers and the LGBT community into one room to talk about how you can work together and share resources, um, get input from young people and, and LGBT families. Um, absolutely implement LGBTQ specific policy. Um, there was a question about uh, where you can find those. So if you go to that, that map um, that I showed earlier and click on the states in purple, you can actually pull up each state's LGBTQ specific policy. And you can also see in other states um, where they have protections or to the extent that they have them. And what we hear from um, sort of all over is that really it's about culture change. It's about um, both from the top 
and the message from the bottom of that. We're going to have an affirming environment, um, working with young people um, when you see or hear things that, that aren't affirming, um, working with staff to ensure that everybody understands that this is a safe and affirming environment. Um, initial training, but also ongoing coaching. Um, talked about positive youth engagement um, data. Uh, signs and language. Um, anytime we can have up signs that it's a safe place or having a rainbow sticker on your badge or cell phone cover or anything that lets people, young people know that you're a safe person or safe space is really just huge. And telegraphing a message that you're a safe person to talk to. Um, and doing ongoing training about how to use gender neutral language and your discussions and all of those things. Um, the final thing in the sort of bubble, I would say, is anything that you're doing, um, specifically mention, or explicitly mention, how are LGBTQ youth a part of this discussion? Um, that can be really transformative just to make sure you're uh, explicitly thinking about this. I think we've done a much better job of thinking about that along. Um, race and ethnicity lines, but important um, here too. So um, in all of the spare time, <laughs> I know you all have as juvenile justice professionals, um, these are probably like the top things I would say to take a look at. Um, the FACT-J recommendations and listening session, um, Hidden Injustice, it was part of the seminal report about the experiences of LGBT youth in juvenile justice settings. Um, there's a great guide that Shannon Wilbur at the National Center for Lesbian Rights wrote for Annie E. Casey, um, which is just a wonderful resource. Uh, the Safe Havens Report that we wrote with Center for the Study of Social Policy and Children's Rights that I, I referenced. Um, and then a Restoring Justice, um, which is a blueprint for establishing policy. And then finally, um, I saw I'll click on our questions really quickly. I saw one that was really great. Um, so one was about um, psychosocial assessments. Um, when young people are um, doing evaluations, I think around um, uh, sexual behavior post adjudication. Um, so I will just say on, on that front that I think, again, it's really important to make sure that the professionals that are doing those evaluations um, either have experience working with LGBT youth or consulting with folks about how to better incorporate those questions in their evaluations. Um, we do see a much higher rate of LGBT youth being um, prosecuted for um, sex offenses. And um, I think a piece of that sometimes is motivated by um, sometimes parents of, of victims who um, may not um, be willing to acknowledge or comfortable with the fact that their child may have been engaging in in um, sexual behavior with someone of the same sex or sometimes fueled by discrimination or perceptions of LGBT young people as being more prone to victimize others, which of course is not true and has no, um, no basis. And also I think just as an LGBT young person, navigating dating and, and having sexual relations with both can be really daunting because um, we do have our world framed in sort of a heteronormative or cisnormative way. Um, so really, you know, it, it can be a factor and I think making sure that evaluators are aware um, is it, really, really important. Um, I think that the presentation, you will have um, access to it. Um, another question about whether youth are able to choose for themselves to begin hormone therapy. Um, so just a word, a lot of um, what some people refer as sex reassignment surgery, um, which I think a lot of trans people refer to as gender confirmation surgery, um, again, given that they sort of always identified as the sex that they are. Um, really, that isn't, in, except for rare circumstances, is only for kids, for young people over 18 um, in most situations. So that's you know, maybe a consideration depending on the age of the system that you're in or how long kids can stay involved in the system. Um, um, for cross-hormone therapy or puberty blockers, um, it just really depends state to state on what the age of consent is or if a young person may have been emancipated. Um, in some states, there is some latitude as you're an older teen. In others, you do need to get parental consent. Um, in a lot of states, via involvement in the juvenile justice system, they may be able to go to court. Um, if parents are ultimately 
after a chance to consult with doctors and, and come to a place of understanding aren't um, is something that you can proceed with. Um, another one that I saw is that there, there, there certainly is some conflicting information about um, placement of trans folks in correctional settings in accordance with their identity. Um, and I think it's important to think about um, what we're basing our recommendations are. Um, you know, again, having a young person's identity affirmed in all aspects um, is critical for their well-being and good for their well-being. Um, we certainly understand that, you know, there may be youth or staff who don't really understand that a trans person, regardless of their genitalia, um, you know, identifies as female or male and should be treated that way. But um, really, that is just a matter of education and work. And I think the providers that you know, we have we profiled in safe havens are ones that have really put the professional standards, legal obligations into place and sort of made it reality. Yeah the name of our report for young people. So, um, so I, I'm not necessarily saying that this, um, waters are easy to navigate, but folks successfully have in school settings, attention, other places. So um, knowing that our framework is, is based on what's good for youth, um, then I think that that's our starting place to work through, um, through those issues. And let me see. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the other question that I saw um, is about trans youth in facilities, and basically Priya says that trans youth should be um, allowed to um, suggest what the gender of the person allowed to search them. So there is some guidance there, and some of the LGBTQ specific policies I mentioned spell that out. Um, and the question of whether documentation comes in, is there better to refer to the individual as they identify? Absolutely. Um, that is a definite yes on that one. Let's see. Um, whether hormone replacement therapy is covered by Medicaid um, depends state to state, but in most places that I've worked, folks have been able to um, get hormone replacement therapy covered um, for young people, but definitely um, reach out to people within the LGBT community and there are gender clinics at most children's hospitals. Let's see, we're almost done, but there's one more. Um, yeah, so uh, another question is about HIPAA. Um, I think confidentiality in general, um, Again, great to have some specific policy and protocols around that so everybody is sort of on the same page. But um, really the first thing is just to check with the young person about who they're out to and navigate that with them and make sure that you're not disclosing without their consent. Sometimes you may have an emergent situation where we have to, um, or if you have to, definitely let them know um, so they can prepare about how to do that in a way that's going to be good for them and not put them at risk. Um, so some of these questions, um, I am definitely able to help navigate with you on a case-by-case -case basis. So please reach out to me via email. My email is at the end of the, the PowerPoint presentation. Um, and uh, the, the um, let's see, one more, I think the, um, the map that I mentioned is not on um, the correctional, uh, the Council of Juvenile Correctional Administrators website, but on Lambda Legal. So if you go Lambda Legal map juvenile justice, it'll pop up and the link is in the PowerPoint. Um, and any other questions I'm happy to, to answer via email or feel free to give me a call anytime. Um, and I think that pretty much wraps pretty much up our our, uh, our our marathon of of information in an hour and a half. So I want to thank everybody for joining. Thank you.